At once, terrifying and breathtaking. Lightning is one of the most deadly and most perplexing natural phenomena on Earth. Since the beginning of time, it has been interpreted as the wrath of God. It has captivated our awestruck imaginations and has forever changed the lives of those who came too close. Lightning strikes indiscriminately and without warning. Hundreds of times each year, unsuspecting humans are the victims. Some tempt fate by hiking in the high Sierras or by taking storm photos in an open field, while others become victims doing mundane routines, like walking to the post office or making dinner. When a storm comes, it's best to take cover, although sometimes there's no place to hide, because exactly how lightning forms and why it strikes where it does remains unexplained. Rising above its neighboring peaks in the Sierra Nevada mountain range is Mount Whitney, the highest mountain in the contiguous United States. Every year, thousands of hikers travel to the eastern edge of California to climb the 14,496-foot summit. On the morning of Saturday, July 14, 1990, Michael Wasson and his brother-in-law, Terry Neighbors, set out for Whitney's summit. Their plan was to make the 22-mile round-trip hike in one long day, returning to the base of the mountain just after dark. The weather report at the Inyo National Forest Ranger Station called for a slight chance of an afternoon thunderstorm, common during the summer. As Michael and Terry reached 11,000 feet, the tree line gave way to a more strenuous trek over boulders and broken rock and thinner air. Mike was in better shape than I was, definitely, and, and I was having a tough time keeping up with him, but we had to keep a pace in order to get up to the top at a certain time so we could come back down. At the top of the switchback trail, they came to a pass with a dramatic view to the east and west. When we got there, we could see there were quite a few clouds uh, in the sky, and some of them looked like rain clouds, but most of them were off in the distance. What Michael and Terry couldn't see were threatening storm clouds on the other side of the mountain. They walked on. Soon, the stone hut that stood at the peak was in view. Just as the summit was now easily within reach, only 500 more feet to climb, the weather turned quickly. It was just instantaneous. This cloud just came over and it felt like it just dumped down on us. It was nearly five o'clock in the evening. The temperature fell rapidly. Rain and sleet drenched the barren rock. The hikers searched for shelter. We looked for uh, a good 10 minutes for any kind of shelter we could find. But at that altitude, uh, there's really not a lot. There's scree, you know, small broken up rocks uh, strewn all over the place. Uh, but there were no large uh, natural shelters of any sort at that altitude. Lightning struck randomly at the granite peak. The only shelter Michael could find was a small rock jutting out among the boulders. We were pretty much totally exposed. I mean, imagine yourself trying to find shelter in a parking lot or an open field. So when we finally found this, this little rock, it seemed like a real godsend. A frightening display of electrical flashes strobed across the darkened sky. Terry and Michael, unprepared for the foul weather, were both soaked to the bone. To shield themselves from the freezing rain, Terry unfolded an emergency blanket from his pack. They each held up one corner of the blanket in front of the rocky overhang. It did keep us quite a bit warmer, and we, and we sat there for a good 30 seconds or so before I, um, it occurred to me that this thing was made out of some kind of uh, metallicized uh, substance. The last thing that I recall before it happened, um, Mike says, you know, let me see the package that this storm blanket came in. That's when the lightning struck, shredding the silvery blanket into hundreds of tiny pieces and slamming the men against the rocks. I remember thinking, uh, you know, what in the world's going on here? What's this, what's this all about? Um, and then my, then I realized that I wasn't, I hadn't been hearing anything in my 
deafness slowly started to fade and I could hear myself screaming and I could hear Terry screaming. His legs were, were uh, thrust out in front of him and he was shaking, he was convulsing, uh, like in some kind of seizure. And then I realized what was happening, you know, we were being electrocuted. And, and I looked down and I saw my own legs out in front of me uh, convulsing as well. Michael's body burned with a tremendous heat. He brought his legs into his chest and tried to roll over the rocks to put out what he thought was a fire. There were no flames, but his skin had turned bright purple and there were visible burns on his hands and fingers. And I looked back up under the rock and there was Terry. Terry was still uh, in spasms and still writhing around and he was moaning, um, really a, a really scary sound, uh, kind of a primordial scream. Michael dragged Terry out from the rock. He lodged a pair of sunglasses in Terry's mouth so he wouldn't choke on his tongue. And I thought that was the biggest problem until all of a sudden all the noise stopped, all the motion stopped, and he just... Terry had stopped breathing. Michael performed CPR on his brother-in-law's motionless body. It was a good um, 15 minutes uh, before I, I finally realized uh, he's not coming back. Uh, this, is, this is it. Meanwhile, the lightning had not abated and it was continuing to strike really all around me. Sometimes I'd even get a little tingle as the, as the charge traveled through the ground. Michael kept pushing air into Terry's lungs. A few minutes later, Terry opened his eyes. I said, Terry, we got hit by lightning. Uh, we, we've got to get out of here. And his immediate response was, what happened? Um, I said, again, Terry, we've been hit by lightning. Terry had fractured a vertebrae in his back. He had burns on his face, hands, and ankles. Michael helped him to his feet and supported his limp body. He weighed their options, to find another rock shelter or get off the mountain. It was only a matter of time before lightning struck again. I saw it strike, and it was about five feet in front of us. It hit the ground, and you know the charge traveled right up our legs. I could feel it as it happened. I think at that point is when Mike decided uh, he was pretty much in charge of the expedition. He decided that we needed to get off the mountain. As quickly as possible, they started their descent, exhausted and shivering. They hurried over the ice-covered rocks and took steep shortcuts across the trail. I basically uh, kept taunting Terry to get him to go forward. And I said to him, Terry, do you ever want to see your wife again? Do you ever want to see your kids again? I really thought that, that if I could just get some rest, that I would feel better. And I think probably if I would have had my choice and we would have stayed, uh, we might have not come off the mountain. Having survived two close calls with lightning, Terry and Michael now feared that they might die of hypothermia. Finally, after struggling for four hours, they found a campsite. The campers put the shivering hikers in sleeping bags and gave them hot soup. Word of the injured hikers had been radioed to the Inyo County authorities. A search and rescue team was now on its way up the mountain. By midnight, they reached Michael and Terry. They determined that there were no broken bones and no serious burns and that we'd be stable uh, to make it through the night. And um, so we just spent the night there in the tent. The next morning, Terry was airlifted to the hospital. Michael chose to walk out on his own. I felt and I'd hiked all the way up the mountain, got that close to the summit and, um, you know, got beaten back pretty severely and I felt like I really needed to walk out of there under my own power. Though most of us are aware of our vulnerability in the middle of a thunderous lightning storm, few realize how much scientists still have to learn about its deadly bolts. We don't understand exactly how it strikes the ground. We don't understand exactly how that connection is made, what gets struck and why. We don't understand exactly how it gets started in the cloud. Martin Newman is one of the world's top lightning researchers. For 25 years, he's tried to unravel these mysterious details about lightning. Researchers believe that lightning is a reaction caused by electrically unbalanced storm clouds. Lightning is a big version of the little spark 
that you get when you shuffle across the rug and separate charge between you and the rug and then touch the doorknob. So that's a spark that's maybe a few millimeters long. Lightning can be 10 miles, it can even be 50 or 60 miles long. Each year, more and more hikers discover this awesome force of nature too late to find shelter and are seriously injured or killed. What is it that makes us so vulnerable? People are struck by lightning because of two things. One is either they're the tallest thing around or they're connected to the tallest object around them. If, if they're the tallest, like in an open field or on a mountaintop, uh, lightning is looking for the easiest connection to ground and the person is standing on the ground and so the, the circuit is complete. At high elevations, finding shelter in the mountains is nearly impossible. Michael and Terry thought they were protected by the rocks, but lightning can harm even when it doesn't strike directly. When it strikes in the mountains, the uh, person may be trying to hide in a rocks and when it's raining hard and lightning hits the outside of the rock, the current travels through the water and comes all the way down and just dribbles right with the water and comes into the cave and into the rocks, and so you really don't have any protection. Determined to complete the mission they started, both Terry and his brother-in-law Michael have been back to Whitney and reached its peak, this time without injury and under clear skies. Now, they live with the memories of battling nature. When you do things like climb a mountain or go hiking in the wilderness, there is a certain risk involved and uh, you take that chance. Nature is something that you really can't fight or, or try to control. You just have to accept it. I feel like for the first time in many, many years, I've really come to appreciate uh, the time that, that we have on this earth and have learned to make the most of that time because you just don't know. You don't know when your last breath will come. A surprising number of people survive contact with lightning because they don't receive its full force. Scientists aren't sure, but they suspect that most of the lightning's energy travels around the body, not into it. What does get inside can severely damage the nervous system and alter brain function. And as one California woman discovered, there is no cure. On a chilly September morning in 1991, Joyce Hodge left her home in San Jose, California and drove to work. Dark clouds began to fill the morning skyline. At the office, Joyce made herself a hot cup of tea, then sat at her desk and put on a phone headset. Her right foot rested on a small space heater. From her chair, Joyce watched the rain hit the window. Coworkers were complaining about the foul weather. Joyce was fascinated, but as the storm drew closer, she felt uneasy. The lightning was so loud that you could actually hear it crackling, and the thunder shook the building. Suddenly, lightning flashed and thunder cracked at the same time. The building had been hit. Electricity from the strike traveled through the phone lines and into Joyce's headset. The current attracted by the metal space heater also surged into her foot. Instantly, Joyce felt pain and confusion. I thought I was having a heart attack. I started having sharp pains in my chest and down my right arm. Aware that something was terribly wrong, Joyce tried to tell her boss about the pain. Only the words would not come out. Afterwards, she told me that it was as if I was talking Chinese. She couldn't understand a word I was saying. Her condition worsened, and an ambulance was called. From sitting in the back resting, and then getting up to go to the hospital, I found that I wasn't able to put my right leg down, because every time I would try to put it down, it felt like there was a hay hook in my heart and snatching on it. Suddenly, as she left with the paramedics, Joyce's pain dissipated. She was overcome by a feeling she describes as warm and comfortable. I was like in a real bright light, felt like I was like in a cloud. Everything was real bright and warm and I felt really at peace. Joyce's puzzling moment of peace was brief. At the hospital, doctors could not find the source of her terrible pain. 
Many doctors dismiss the complaints of lightning victims because internal lightning injuries do not show on standard tests or x-rays. Lightning researchers believe the perplexing damage can't be found because it occurs at the cellular level. Our whole body works on electrical impulses, whether it's your nerves or muscles or your cardiac rhythm. It's all electrical. It's not unreasonable to think that if you pass a, even a tiny electric charge uh, through the body, that you may irreversibly or perhaps reversibly change some of these enzymes and, and cell mechanisms. The damaged nerve may actually signal the brain that it's perceiving pain or irritation or something that isn't actually going on to the person. There was not one part of my body that did not hurt. My eyes hurt. I wasn't able to comb my hair because my hair hurt. Walking, I mean, it was a crawling thing. I couldn't walk. After a two-day stay in the hospital, Joyce was sent home, her pain and suffering still unexplained. Over time, Joyce's bizarre list of physical ailments grew to include a change in food tastes, constant thirst, skin that dyed and peeled, insomnia, and hair loss. My body now changes temperatures all the time. Like, I cannot sleep without a fan on me. At one time, my body was getting so hot that I was getting blisters. Right now, I have problems with my bones feeling like ice cubes. That hurts. It hurts a lot, and there's absolutely nothing that could be done about it. Mentally, Joyce battles with other debilitating symptoms, like memory loss, and a change in her personality. Before, I was a member of the senior choir at my church. I taught sign language. I taught Sunday school. Um, now I don't remember any sign language. I don't remember any verses of the Bible. I don't remember any songs. I've gone from enjoying being around people to feeling most comfortable being alone. To find relief, Joyce spends most of her time in her backyard, tending to her flowers and vegetables. When a neighbor's negligence damaged her garden, Joyce went into an uncontrollable rage, another side effect of the lightning. All I could think about was the only way I was going to calm down was to kill the man. And I stayed up three days. I couldn't sleep. I cried for three days. I was so depressed over the whole situation and stuff. And during that entire time, I was planning on how to kill the next door neighbor. Finally, Joyce snapped out of her rage frightened by how natural her thoughts seemed at the time. You know, afterwards, I know it's crazy, but during the time, nothing logical. I don't think anything logical. And that is one of the most scariest things, you know, for me. It is still not clear exactly why some people survive being struck by lightning. Even though the surface of lightning is about six times hotter than that of the sun's, much of the energy dissipates in the air before reaching a target on the ground. Very little is known about its long-term effects on the human body. One of the few researchers studying the medical effects of lightning is Dr. Marianne Cooper, a professor of emergency medicine at the University of Illinois in Chicago. She has been chronicling the effects of lightning for over 20 years. One of the most difficult things for the victim of lightning or electrical injury is being believed. If you get hit by lightning, most of the time the person's going to look the same from the outside, but they're not going to be the same person on the inside. Their wiring isn't going to be working right, and uh, the, the software uh, in their brain may not work, be working the same way. Another lightning researcher is Margaret Primo, a neuropsychologist at the Chicago Medical School. She says that the nervous system and blood vessels are particularly vulnerable to electricity because they are liquid and provide an easy path for the current to travel. We also know that current enters the head through the orifices, eyes, ears, nose, mouth, 
and what's in between your eyes and ears is your brain. So there's every reason to think that the current travels through the brain, even if the person doesn't have a, a, an obvious wound in the head. Using a controversial new mapping technique called quantitative electroencephalography, or QEEG, Joyce's brain activity was tested. The results were read by neurologist Fernando Miranda. The areas of the brain that were not working well in Joyce's case were the frontal regions of the brain and the temporal region on the right side of her brain. Those areas of the brain would affect judgment, impulse control, memory, uh, and spatial orientation. This type of brain damage, Margaret Primo believes, could be responsible for Joyce's uncontrollable anger. So it's that loss of uh, veneer on the personality. I don't think it's a new part of herself that was never there before, but it was a part she could manage in the past, talk herself out of or reason with herself. For Joyce, who can no longer remember how old she is or watch the lightning storm she once enjoyed, hope for a complete recovery is grim. The numerous medicines prescribed to her over the years have treated her symptoms, but offered no cure. The central nervous system does not heal. The peripheral nervous system does grow back again. The spinal cord does not heal. So if this has caused a permanent injury in the brain itself, it will not heal. With further research, Dr. Cooper says new drugs may one day offer relief for the nerve and brain damage of those injured by lightning. For now, recovery depends upon supportive friends and doctors and a determination to survive. For a long time, I really wished that it had killed me. I wished that I had died. But I've gotten to the point where now things are normal, pretty much, to me. Every second, about 100 flashes of lightning strike somewhere on Earth. The chances of being struck by one of those bolts are one in 500,000. Incredibly, it happened to one woman not once, but three times. At one o'clock in the afternoon on September 15, 1983, Linda Cooper had just finished work. The weather in Fort Lauderdale had been stormy all morning. Now, just as she was about to run a few errands, the threatening skies had turned to a light shower. Florida has a lot of storms, and that's just the way it is. And when it lightens up, you go do what you need to do. So when I got off work, I needed to go to the bank and the post office. And so I chanced it, and I went. Linda left the bank and drove across the street to the post office. She parked next to the curb, close to the entrance. I had a, a small package and some envelopes to be mailed, and I needed to get some stamps. Just a normal post office visit, and I just stepped up and started to turn to go towards the door, and the lightning struck. I felt like a hand grenade had been thrown at me. The light was the brightest light I'd ever seen. The noise was deafening. A bolt of lightning from the sky struck the flagpole in front of the post office and jumped to Linda. She was thrown onto the sidewalk. I believe that it, it jumped across from the flagpole and hit me in the head because I have a spot in my head that I can feel, and it's tender, and there's a slight indentation there. Um, and from the way it just traveled in my body. From that day on, Linda was plagued by symptoms common to strike victims. Chronic fatigue, pain, memory loss, and stabbing headaches. Worn out from her injuries and fear, Linda was still grateful to be alive. This strike changed my life as I knew it forever. I lost a lot of time with a teenage daughter. I did a lot of sleeping when I could have been doing things with her. It changed relationships that were in my life at the time. It made me appreciate every day. Linda spent the next 10 years rebuilding a life nearly destroyed by lightning and lived in fear of thunderstorms. I was very cautious of lightning. I would have never picked up a telephone, never done dishes, never done laundry, never done anything that I knew that you're not supposed to do in lightning. In May 1993, while Linda spoke on the phone with her daughter, 
another Florida storm erupted. And about that time, a crack of lightning came through the telephone and caught me in the side of the face. Shook our house. I screamed and dropped the phone, and my husband came running. Struck for the second time, Linda was frightened more than she was injured. I could feel that same tingle, which is a nerve-ending feeling. And I was sitting there just in shock, thinking, oh no, God, please, oh no, why? This time, her pain and fatigue lasted only a few months. The following year, Linda and her family moved to South Carolina, where the threat of lightning was not as severe. When a thunderstorm blew in on July 11, 1994, experience had taught Linda what to do and what not to do. I knew I couldn't clean house, and I couldn't wash clothes, and I couldn't sew, and I couldn't use anything electric. Dinner was cooking in the crock pot, and Linda sat down at the kitchen table to work on a craft project. Then she decided to make a dessert. My family likes dessert, jello. So I got up to make jello, and I made this jello, and I put it in the refrigerator, and I'm in neat nick, so I went right back to the sink to wash out the container. And I turned on the faucets, and the lightning cracked, and it came right through and ran up my arms. This time I felt it, and I felt like my arms were on fire. So I walked to my refrigerator and opened the freezer and put my upper body and my arms into the freezer and stood there with my arms in the freezer trying to cool myself down. Linda sat frozen at the kitchen table until her husband found her two and a half hours later. I just looked at him and I started crying. I said, honey, it got me again. And he just came over and held me and said, what happened, what happened? And I told him and I said, I never ever want to tell anybody. Having suffered the trauma and upheaval of not one, but three lightning strikes, Linda is left with many unanswered questions, including why. Do some people attract lightning? Someone has been struck more than once, it's just a, a, a random occurrence in the sense that there's nothing unique about that individual. However, there's something common perhaps in where she's been, perhaps she's outdoors a lot or whatever. Well, you're injured. Whether they are struck multiple times or just once, many lightning victims are reluctant to talk about their experiences because they feel embarrassed or are tired of not being believed. A group called the Lightning Strike and Electric Shock Victims International was started in 1989 to help survivors share their stories. I've been struck by lightning three times. To make a very long, horrible story short, I ended up in the hospital for six days. I didn't know anybody who'd been struck by lightning at that time. Now I do, and I understand that a lot of them have the same exact feelings that I've had. A third of all lightning deaths and injuries occur during outdoor recreational activities. Many at the group's annual conference had been struck by lightning while golfing. One man was in his driveway, rolling up the windows in his van when lightning caught him. I had come down and hit the van. And I had a hold of the van. I went down through my left side. What keeps many of the group's survivors talking is knowing that someone else might listen and learn from their mistakes. The most important thing for me is to let people know that you don't mess around with lightning. Don't play golf in lightning. There'll be another day to play golf. Don't plow your fields in lightning. Don't walk the beach in lightning. Just be very careful with it because it is powerful and it will hurt you or kill you. Nature's fury has for centuries fueled fantastic myths and legends. Though science can explain much of what we see in the sky, many still believe in what they regard as the mystical power behind lightning. An amateur photographer thinks he has recorded this supernatural presence on film. Like many photographers who chase lightning, Steve Melvin has a unique relationship with the fiery bolts. Where hunters will chase uh, animals for a photographer, the trophy is the one picture. And a photographer will go to any lengths to try to capture that one photo that's going to reach out and really hit home. Over the years, Steve has been lucky enough to catch some of the breathtaking beauty of storms with his camera. 
Most were taken in front of his home in Madison, Ohio. On the hot and humid evening of June 12, 1989, a promising thunderstorm was building in the east, moving steadily across Lake Erie. Steve tracked the late night squall on the TV news and prepared for what he hoped would be an exceptional lightning display. Normally what I do is I'll take out probably uh, two cameras and two tripods and uh, get everything set up and start timing the lightning bolts as the storm will move in. He checked on the storm's progress every 15 minutes. By midnight, the storm loomed just on the horizon in front of his home. The lightning bolts Steve had been waiting for were now shattering the black sky. I was seeing some unique lightning that seemed beautiful. I thought maybe this was my night. Steve walked outside where his camera stood loaded and ready. He picked up the cable release. He opened the shutter, let the lightning bolts flash through the lens, and advanced the film about a dozen times. The lightning show went on. He pressed the cable release again. All of a sudden, there was a funny sensation in the air, almost like you're in a vacuum tube. Um, the hair started to come up on my arms. And at this point, I thought, this isn't right. Steve thought he should pack up and get inside, only he couldn't move. It was though I was nailed to the ground. I heard a sizzle as though you would put a steak on a grill, just a very quick and with that, that was the last thing I heard. The sizzle was followed immediately by a white flash of light. The sensation came over me. It's though I had been drugged. Very peaceful, very calm. I started to cry, but I didn't know why. And these weren't tears of fear, but it was though something had come over me and every problem, every worry, everything that had ever happened to me was gone. Steve next remembers lying on his back. Lightning flashed in the sky around him. Rain poured hard in his face. He grabbed his camera and ran into the house. The casing on the camera looked melted. Now I was scared because I'm realizing the things that did take place and the fact that I'm still here and I'm wondering what happened. The damaged camera was sent away and disassembled by a technician. The film, which was not destroyed, was removed and processed. What developed was unlike anything Steve had ever seen before. When I first looked at that photo, it just looked like almost a ghost, if you will, of a body. Uh, you could see the two eye holes, maybe where the eyes would be, uh, maybe part of an arm, part of two legs, a torso, and then just very, very scary. For years, Steve has struggled to come up with an explanation for the emotions he felt. Was it a near-death experience? The photo, he says, could be proof that a spiritual force was at work. It had to capture something that no one can explain. It had to be something out of the ordinary. Lightning researcher Martin Newman says he doesn't know what the image is. He did observe that the bolts, the way Steve looks at the photo, are upside down. Oh, this is a photograph of a cloud to ground lightning. There's the main channel to ground and here's the downward branching. Also shown on the picture are these uh, bright spots and here's these streaks. But the question is, what are they? The, the answer is, I don't know what this is. It seems like everyone has a different idea of what it is. I even had a psychic once tell me that he thought I captured my soul leaving my body. Uh, it's very hard to say what really happened. Some say it could be water on the lens, or that the camera may have been jolted during the long exposure time. Meteorologist and minister Andre Benier believes that these options are all possible. However, he says, there is always room for speculation about the mysterious workings of God. I tend to look at the picture and see if there is a physical explanation first and foremost. But what about the strange apparitions that you see of the human anatomy? Uh, there's no clear-cut explanation. Sure, it would be real interesting and real neat to believe that there was something ethereal, something perhaps spiritual that was captured on film. 
this side of eternity, I don't think we'll, we'll ever know, but it's nice to speculate. Some of Steve's physical experiences are consistent with those of others who have come close to lightning. He describes his hair standing on end, a warning that lightning is about to strike. When the lightning comes down to the ground, it comes close to the surface and then it looks around in about a 50 yard radius just searching for something to hit. The uh, trees, power lines, power poles, people's hair standing on end, all of those are sort of streamering up, reaching up to, to say, uh, I'm, I'm your, one of your possible connectors, and then that's the one that it hits. Steve also says that when the lightning hit the ground, he heard no thunder, only a sizzle, another indication that he was very close to a strike. Thunder is caused by a super rapid heating of the air right next to the lightning bolt. It expands out probably to anywhere between 50 and 100 yards. And then that wave collapses on itself. Well, it's that action, which happens in milliseconds, that produces the wave, the audible wave that we hear is thunder. If you are inside that first compression ring, all you hear is a little tin or a pop or a crackle. What remains unexplainable are the mysterious feelings of peace and joy Steve describes. Joyce felt it too. So did hiker Michael Wasson. It was actually very tempting to just close my eyes and, and go with the moment and be you know, carried away by this, this warm, comfortable feeling. Um, and I was pretty sure that if I, if I surrendered to it, that's exactly what would happen. I, you know, that would be the end of me. Now, Steve Melvin is more cautious of the lightning when he chases the storms with his camera. He hopes that one day, someone will tell him exactly what he's captured on film. Most who survive lightning strikes suffer serious medical problems. In a few rare cases, some claim to have been healed. In July 1993, Betty Galvano fell and fractured her hip. To set the bone correctly, a 10-inch steel rod was surgically implanted in her right femur and hip bone. For a year, she hobbled with a walker, then a cane. Her slow recovery significantly changed her energetic lifestyle. I've always been a very active person. And all of a sudden, I couldn't do much of anything. Whenever I stood up to walk, my leg would feel like a sandbag, just really heavy. And I would just stand there and grimace and say, OK, now. And I'd take a step. Betty, a devout Catholic, asked her friends to pray with her for a quick recovery. I always prayed about my leg because, you know, the Catholic Church, we kneel a bit. And that was so hard, trying to kneel and sometimes not kneeling when I wanted to kneel. On Saturday, June 11, 1994, Betty went to afternoon mass and confession. She then returned to her son's home in Fort Myers, where she was visiting. Around 5 o'clock that evening, Betty was in the kitchen cutting broccoli. Outside, a storm approached. The kitchen window was open behind closed blinds, which blocked Betty's view of the dark storm clouds. And all of a sudden, there was just a tremendous clap of thunder. And it just seemed like the whole kitchen lit up and it shook me around and the knife flew up in the air and the broccoli flew all over the kitchen. And I slumped over on the counter and I immediately felt like millions and millions of needles were going into my foot. My leg was numb. I couldn't move it from the knee down. Betty's astonished husband got up from the kitchen table and took hold of her. He carried Betty to the couch and massaged her numb leg until the feeling came back. And while I was laying on the couch, I looked out the window over the backyard, and the end of the rainbow was there. And it was just so beautiful. And I, I knew, I just knew that God was taking care of me. I knew I was in God's hands. And uh, when I sat up uh, and stood up, all this, uh, the heaviness that had been in my leg was gone. It was just full of energy. When her daughter returned home from work that evening, she noticed a change in her mother's condition. I saw a big difference in the way she was walking. She wasn't complaining about her pain anymore. And it, it was just unreal. I mean, because I knew how, how much pain she was in.
I mean, she could have gotten killed, and she wasn't. Betty suspects the lightning came in through the open window or through the dishwasher and into her bare feet. The next day, she went to church and told the priest what had happened. And he sort of laughed and he says, well, you got zapped by the spirit. And that's kind of the way I feel about it. I got zapped by the spirit. Could the lightning flash have eased the pain in Betty's leg? Or was the experience merely a placebo, an excuse to believe she'd been spiritually healed? Medically, the healing possibility is always there, experts say, because so much is still unknown about lightning. In fact, small amounts of controlled electrical charges have been used to treat depression and heal fractures. But when it comes to an accidental healing by lightning, many specialists have their doubts. There are apocryphal stories everywhere about people who were deaf, struck by lightning and could hear, people who were blind, struck by lightning and can see. It certainly can do vast damage to the nervous system. It can connect and disconnect the wiring. So I wouldn't want to say it's impossible that it could do something miraculous like that, but taking things apart are much easier than putting things back together. One thing I have learned from talking to the, all of these people is to have a very open mind and to keep listening and keep uh, trying to figure out what's going on with them. In general, lightning tends to make somebody worse rather than better. And praise God if, if it made somebody better. But I wouldn't recommend standing out in a thunderstorm to cure whatever ails you. To learn more about the mysterious powers of lightning, scientists from around the world conduct research at the University of Florida's Lightning Lab. Here, they make artificial lightning by firing rockets into thunderstorm clouds above their research grounds. Lightning is difficult to study because it never strikes where you want it to strike at the time that your instruments are ready to measure it. So the advantage of the triggered lightning program uh, is we can fire these rockets with the wires and, and force the cloud to produce a lightning down the wire into what we want. Studying lightning survivors is obviously more difficult because human subjects cannot be exposed to lightning in a controlled environment. For researchers, it's the mystery that surrounds these cases that keeps them listening to survivors, so that one day they will understand why some survive and some do not. It may be that different amounts of energy are getting into uh, the person because of, of different strengths of the lightning strike, different uh, clothing that they're wearing, uh, if they were wet or dry. We really don't have good explanations for that. Um, I think a lot of work needs to be done in that area to be able to explain the, the range of the injuries. It's this mysteriousness of the individual picture that interests me, that it isn't always the same presentation, it isn't always the same course, and we don't know why. And that's the part that I want to study more. One of the first serious studies of lightning began over 200 years ago, when Benjamin Franklin flew his famous kite. Before that time, man made sense out of lightning with stories about its mythological powers. American Indians believed the wings of a godlike bird made thunder. The Greeks believed it was Zeus who hurled lightning in anger. And the Romans used lightning to predict the future. Whether feared or worshipped, lightning has a place in nature's delicate balance. There's about 100 lightnings a second striking the Earth all the time. There's a balance between the charge coming down and charge flowing up in regions of fair weather. Exactly what those charges do, uh, what the Earth's electric field does to the biological systems, what the Earth's magnetic field does for that matter, we don't really understand. Though it seems we live in tandem with lightning, it has indiscriminately interrupted thousands of lives. As we climb to the highest peaks and walk about the towns we live in, or chase the storms that unleash the hypnotic bolts. The consequences are varied and perplexing. Emotional trauma, neurological damage, and unanswered questions. But a world without lightning might not only be unlivable, it would also deprive us of a most spectacular light show 
and one of nature's most unexplainable powers.